Yeah, so what, what I'm reading is a text that's in the CD booklet um, to the, in the Digipack, the regular trade edition of this new CD. It's, it's something that, w that is slightly modified from this book I'm working on that's my kind of self-biography, um, which doesn't really have a title yet, but I'm considering, I mean, a working title is, um, I dreamed I was a very clean tramp. Um, and so this is a, a little short excerpt from that. Beyond Gardenside, there were tobacco farms and cornfields and livestock. By the time we moved away from Kentucky when I was 15, the fields had been pushed further off by new streets, but open land was right there in the 50s. We were one of the first families to move into the development, and the hills around us were still rows of construction sites. When I was in elementary school, we played in them. Our usual game was dirt clod fights. The lots were piled high with were piled with high mounds of dirt. We'd play army, using the dirt piles as cover and ammunition. The strewn planks and tar paper rolls and concrete blocks were recreation equipment too. <laughs> it's a per perfect like soundtrack. Um, I have I had my first scientific insight at that time. I was carefully scouting over a rise for enemies when I realized that since by raising up to look enough of my head to include my eyes had to be exposed that if I could see anyone, that person could also see me. You had to come out of hiding in order to see anything. It was almost more pleasurable to undergo the insight than it was to get its message. I think that's why I remember it. After all, what could I do with the information? It wasn't going to stop me from scouting. Anyway, something in me knew it already. Otherwise, why wasn't I exposing my whole head, which would allow me to see more? So there's another deduction. You can only learn what you already know. It's as true a first-hand experience as it is of pedagogy and literature. We're all puppets. One late afternoon when I was seven, there were only two of us left still messing around outside. We were trying to topple a big iron barrel that was filled with water. Finally, we figured out a way of using wood scraps for levers and pushed it over. We went and sat down in the rubble by the beginning house to talk things over. The building was nothing but floor support, four by tens, across a cinder block foundation with a few two by fours poking up. The whole street smelled lightly of wet dirt, sawn wood, and burnt tar paper. I was thinking that the men who were working here had seen us goofing around before they left for the day. By the time they'd gone, we were the only kids left. Tomorrow morning, they would realize it had been us who knocked over the barrel. Kids already shouldn't be strong enough to turn over something as heavy as that. I explained this to Roy Baker, who was a few months younger than me. They'll want to put us in the circus. Think of how that will be when we come out into the center ring, under the big top, everybody waiting and watching, and then when we're supposed to lift up the barbells, they'll see that we really aren't that strong. There was only one thing to do. We have to run away immediately. We walked and walked, stole some pennies from the dashboard of a car and bought candy and got lost. Finally, as the sun went down, we knocked on a door and found a grown-up to help us get back home. My parents were upset and scolded me severely, but they were happy enough that I'd gotten home safely, but they didn't really punish me. I remember that elated state of using your imagination to conceive situations that some part of you knows are not strictly realistic, but which, at the same time, you believe, and how making someone else believe them or tacitly suspend disbelief actually does make them real and makes you feel good anyway though there's sometimes a slight feeling of contempt for the person you persuade, no matter how disappointed and angry and frustrated you might get, they won't play along. It's like getting someone to go to bed with you. No, the believing does make the situations real. A sensual reality. It's like that line from Paul Bowles' autobiography. Here, for the first time, I was made aware that a human being is not an entity and that his interpretation of exterior phenomena is meaningless unless it is shared by the other members of his cultural group. After writing which, he apologizes for the gratitude. But the point is also that reality is imagination, like grown-ups role-playing sex games, like romance and Roman equal novel, 
I wonder how much of people's lives really takes place on this plane. Religion, for instance. People agreeing to act as if things are really the way someone has imagined them to be in order to make life seem more interesting or bearable. Entertainers and religious leaders and politicians and artists always vying to get elected for having formulated the best story to live in. It's depressing, everything being forced into false coherency. But trying to see reality is like trying to die.